Welcome to Your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Sandy Evans. She is a member of the Fairfax County School Board from the Mason District. Thank you so much for being here, Sandy. Thank you, Katherine, for having me. So you have been on the school board for almost exactly eight years now. That is correct. Mm -hmm. I was uh, elected in uh, March of 2010 in a special election, so I'm coming up on my eighth anniversary. And you have seen a lot of things happen in eight years. I have, yes. This, this is a big school system, you know, and a lot of people outside Fairfax County look at our county as a very affluent county with a lot of resources, mm -hmm. all of which is true. But we also have a huge number of schools. I think we're the 10th largest in the nation. We are, yes. And we have a very mixed population of students. And so representing the needs of all those schools and all those students is a huge job for the school board. So tell us a little bit about what prompted you to actually seek a spot on the school board. Well, originally I was a parent advocate. I started, uh, of course, as so many people do with the PTA, volunteering in my child's classroom. And when she got into middle school, I started thinking about the um, school schedules and how they really didn't um, help the students. And so I became an advocate for later high school start times. At the time, uh, high schools in Fairfax County started at 7.20 in the morning which as we know and increasingly we know from the research is not good for a, a teen body. Uh, they simply are on a different uh, cycle. So I became an advocate in 2004. I co-founded a group called Sleep uh, to advocate for later start times. I thought it would be easy. I thought it would be simple. It was not. It was not simple. Uh, and as the parent of my children graduated from in 04, 05, and 08, uh -huh. so, and they started school at 720, and they I did. thought it was just insane how early they got up to catch the bus and go to school. Yes. It was a long haul. It took us, we finally approved later high school start times in fall of 2014. So it was a decade and then it was for the next fall. So it took more than a decade to accomplish that. You know what I find about tremendous change like that, yes. you know, having experienced it as a resident of Northern Virginia for decades now, is that people have a tendency to forget how mm -hmm. long it took to get there, how it contentious did. it was. I mean, yes. people did battle over that issue. It took yes. 10 years. There was a lot of animosity and there's, there were a lot of hard feelings. Yes. But since t t 2014 or 2015 even, We've got some experience. How has it ended up working out? Is it worked out very well, but you make an excellent point about change. Change is very difficult. It is, particularly when you have to deal with uh, all the different competing interests, different stakeholders, um, all of whom have perfectly reasonable uh, uh, arguments for why change is, is difficult for them. But under my signature now is a quote by Nelson Mandela that says, it always seems impossible until it's done. And that's the way it was with the later start time issue. When we finally got uh, all the, uh, the, the issues aligned, when we worked out the transportation, when we had a superintendent who understood the, the biological need for this change, when we had a school board that was elected uh, that believed in this, when we had a facilities director working uh, and transportation director working with us, it finally got done. And now we have a 10 start times at our high schools and they have worked out very, very well. We still have an issue with our middle schools, and that's something that we, we have to contend with, too. And we can't forget that, that our middle school students are adolescents as well. So, but I agree with you, change is hard, and uh, that got done, and it's worked out very, very well. Jurisdictions throughout the country are doing this more and more. I, I see jurisdictions, uh, school systems all over that are trying to accomplish this. And our governor, uh, Ralph Northam, just the other day mentioned that as one of the things that he would like to tackle, the start time issue. Wow. And so uh, we may have something coming out at the uh, state level as well. So is part of looking at that a matter of the bus transportation too? You've got a fleet of buses and they're trying to deliver elementary school kids, middle school kids, and high school kids? That is one of the barriers that every jurisdiction has contended with. I believe it's important, though, to look at this as a health issue. Right. Because when you look at it as a transportation issue, then people start thinking in terms of bus schedules. Really, we should start the focus on health. It's about student health and about how students need more sleep particularly our teenagers, it's important for their mental health, it's important for their physical health, it's important for their academic health. So if we start from the contention that we need to do this for our student health, then things start falling into place. Then it's how to as opposed to this is about transportation. Well, and you're so right because budgets are nothing more than a statement of priorities. 
that and that's what a budget is. It tell it says what you have prioritized is the most important thing. And again, that's something that the school board works on yes. constantly with the board yes. of supervisors. It's now around the clock. It it really is. It's it's all year round. When I was first on the board, we would have months when we were very intensive and then uh, it would kind of slack off a little bit. Now we have a, a conversation all year long, really. As soon as one fiscal year starts, we start the conversation on the next fiscal year. I'm this year's budget chair, so I'm uh, more in, involved uh, than ever in the budget. And uh, we have a budget now from our superintendent. He uh, proposed it. We are getting ready to approve it as a board. We'll have budget hearings this month. We will have a work session and then we'll approve it in early February. Uh, so we probably should talk a little bit about yes. the priorities in that budget. Uh, teacher pay right. is the top priority. That's been the board's priority. We did get started. We have new teacher scales that we have approved as a board. Getting to those new teacher scales takes money though. Right. And so the superintendent has focused on getting us farther faster in this budget. So he has put in uh, $54 million to improve the teacher scales, plus $44 million. Keep in mind those are big numbers, but this is a $2.9 billion budget right. for the 10th largest school system with 188,000 students. So nonetheless, the, the uh, additions that he has put in has focused primarily on teacher pay and other employee pay as well. We need to bring up our other salaries as well. So some of that is local, obviously. It's about the county budget, but what about money from the state? We need to be getting more money from the state. And of course, in Northern Virginia, I'm gonna circle back to what your original statement was. We do need to be advocating at the state level for more state funding. And again, I, I was pleased to see the governor wanted to focus on teacher pay as well. So um, hopefully the state legislature and the governor will provide some more funding. Mm -hmm. Because we are uh, wealthy as an entire county, that does work against us at the state level because right. of the funding formulas. And one of the points we need to be making in Richmond and throughout our own county is, yes, we, we are overall a wealthy county, but we have tremendous and growing poverty in our county as well. About 29% of our students qualify for free and reduced meals. And it is, that is a growing number. We also have about 20, 20 it's close to uh, 29 to 30% that qualify for English as a second language services. Right. Uh, as, and we also have about 14% of our students qualify for special needs, uh, a, a variety of, of ways. So those, are, uh, those require more resources. It's not, and it's also, we have seen uh, increased need from our ESOL students and increased need from our high poverty students. So we, we have schools in Fairfax County that have 80, over 80% 80 poverty. And there are folks in Richmond, there are even folks in our county that don't understand that we have quite a few schools that are very high poverty schools. You know, it's about scale. So, mm -hmm. so a county mm -hmm. in rural Virginia, for instance, which is also experiencing a lot of poverty. Yes. But overall, they have fewer students Correct. just in the main. So they have fewer right. resources, they have fewer students. Up here, we have 40 Title I schools in Fairfax County. We do, yes. And the sheer number of those yes. students tax the resources we have, despite the fact that we also have more resources. We have uh, 54,000 students that qualify for free and reduced meals. That is the size of most school districts. Right. Yes. Right. So I sit on the board of um, Bright Paths mm -hmm. and one of the things that one of our programs is Food for Thought. Oh, yes. We work uh -huh. with 16 schools so uh -huh. others might eat has power pack. Yes. They work mm -hmm. with some of these schools to send food home on the weekends. So I am very aware of the fact that we are meeting um, a, a need, mm -hmm. a, a very serious need to feed these kids. But it's very ad hoc. So you've got a, a kind of a patchwork of nonprofits Western Fairfax Christian Minity, Ministries, mm -hmm. um, United Correct. Community Ministries are right. all doing work with the public mm -hmm. schools. Um, I work with Grand Involved, so there is yeah. community support, but it's not enough. No, it's not. And our advocates and our nonprofits and our faith community are very, very important to helping our families and our students. Absolutely critical to that. But the school system has its role too, and the county has its role. One of the uh, key philosophies of this school board and previous school boards has been needs-based staffing, for example. So 
we put more money and more resources into the schools with uh, higher needs and with uh, greater challenges. So that is something that we will continue to do and it means that uh, you might have more teachers, you might have uh, more resources at schools with higher needs. Right, and when I went to talk to uh, eight elementary school principals this summer, yes. which was eye-opening for me. I, they were mostly in the Mount Vernon district, uh -huh. but I went to Hybla Valley and yes. I have never seen such an enormous elementary school in my life. Yes. There's like 950 students yes. and I think 95% of them speak Spanish. Yes, there's a, a high, high ESL. So access. right there it's kind of yes. like imagine if you had to provide services again the rest right. of the state looks at us and thinks that Correct. we have so much yes. but it's all in proportion. It is and we have many many students uh, just our sheer numbers are very very high so I'm looking at some of the things in Richmond where there's legislation to help more of our high poverty schools which I, I think is great and I, I need to make sure that some of that goes to the schools here that it's not just to those jurisdictions that overall have high poverty because we have a very great need here. Yeah, there was a press conference yesterday with Delegate O'Quinn and Delegate Aird yes. that the Washington Post published a story. Correct, I was thinking about You know, yes. and it was mm -hmm. urban and it was rural and I had the same thought you did. You know, we also have suburban. So when I talk about things yes. like the community school model, I say the Coalfield schools, I say Petersburg and Richmond, and I say the Route 1 corridor in Fairfax County, because that's suburban, urban, and rural. And Culmore and Annandale. Yeah. Those are, um, so we, we also have uh, very high numbers of students who come from lower income families. Right, and so, so you're absolutely right. Don't, don't, people shouldn't think that there is not, you know, very intense suburban, or what would be consider, yes. considered suburban poverty as well. Correct. And Fairfax is, County is the place that you see that. Yes, you do. And uh, that raises the issue of equity as well. You know, needs-based staffing is one of the ways that we deal with equity. Uh, we have to be sure that no matter what school a student attends, that they have every opportunity and every um, opportunity for the same curriculum as students in, in other parts of the county as well. Uh, so that's, uh, that equity issue is something that we're going to be needing to deal with increasingly here in Fairfax County. And I know that the county as a whole has made equity a major priority yes. for the schools and elsewhere. Yes. And so when we come back from this break, we're going to be talking with Sandy Evans of the Fairfax County School Board about what equity actually means and what they're doing to help create it for every student who is here in Fairfax County. So join us after the break. So, so we, we were, were walking, walking to school. I started thinking about lunch. Mom got me turkey and cheese. She's I smart. Really cheese pizza. Sometimes her mind pizza? wanders. We should have a sleepover. I remember saying, Laura? I think I heard Laura. mom say something. The sign says don't walk. Sometimes it's so overwhelming. I really hope she doesn't have really another bad day. I really hope we don't have another bad day at school today. When you can see learning and attention issues from their side, you can be on their side. Go to understood.org, a free online resource with support and tools to help your child thrive. Hey, you. Yeah, you. Getting that college education? What are you gonna do? Graduate and take some office job? Be like everybody else? Or will you dare do something different? Like be a teacher. You could be my teacher. You got the skills, the smarts. Yes, you. You could be the teacher I never forget. That would be cool. Does that corporate job even have recess? What are you gonna make of yourself? What are you gonna make of me? Welcome back to your Need to Know. I'm your host, Katherine Reed, and joining me today is Sandy Evans, uh, a member of the Fairfax County School Board from the Mason District. Thank you so much for being here, Sandy. Oh, my pleasure, Kathy. So let's, let's help people understand what you mean by equity and how that's different from equality. Yes, equity is different than just being having everything be equal. There are some students who need more of different kinds of help. Um, some, we have language barriers from uh, an increasing number of our students. We also have students who don't have a computer at home. 
right? And that's an issue that we're going to have to grapple with. We've started down this road with a one-to-one -one initiative. We have that. One-to-one uh, -one means that every student will have a computer. And at some of our higher poverty schools, we now have what we call the backpack program, where every student is issued a laptop computer. They can take it home. They can use it at home. At the end of the year, they return it. And this is important for equity, so it's not just our students who uh, come from from uh, higher income families who have their own computer, who can do their homework, who can do their research, we need to to uh, level the playing field a little bit for students who come from either higher poverty backgrounds, um, and to deal with the the language barriers too. So, for example, we do a lot of translation work to make sure that parents, when they come in, that they feel welcome into the school. If, if they don't speak English, that's all right. We can bring a translator in to help you speak with your child's teacher, with your child's principal. This is one reason um, I feel so strongly about parent liaisons. It's one of these issues that uh, isn't on you know, a high, uh, hope, high profile issue, but our parent liaisons, particularly in our high poverty schools and in our high ESOL schools, reach out to parents in whatever way they need to. And so we have just this last year put them, uh, put the full-time parent liaisons on contract until, uh, until then it was, um, it was just, uh, they, they were hourly workers. I was surprised when I first came on the board that these, these are critical, critical employees in our schools who reach out to parents and say, yes, you're welcome in the school. Come and talk with me. I will explain anything about your school or the school system that you don't understand and in a language that you do understand. Well, it's interesting because some of the schools where Grand Involve is, they don't have a PTA. You know, a PTA is a voluntary organization. And and PTAs, so, yes. You know, when you've got parents in, who are working three jobs, variable schedules, hard, language yes. is a problem, you don't have a PTA, which yeah. just makes the problem more magnified because you don't have an organization trying to fill the gaps. And so it was interesting, one of the schools, I guess, had a vegetable distribution day through Arcadia Farms. Uh -huh. And the parents would come and get these vegetables, and so yes. while the parents were there, well, they would hold a meeting. And I'm like, well, that's brilliant and so yes. creative. It's like, you know you're going to have a group of parents here. They're coming to get these vegetables. So it's like, hey, over here for yes. 15 minutes, let's tell you about what's going on in the school. And I think we do have to be creative. We have to start thinking a little bit differently, and we have. Uh, our schools where they either have a, an international night and perhaps combine some, um, some business meeting with it just so all the parents are fully informed. Um, there are a lot of things that, that uh, PTAs can do to try to bring parents in. Uh, Renmar Park is a good example where they wanted to involve the dads more, so they started a group called uh, Men of Renmar Park. And uh, the men came in on Saturday and started working on the playground, and they got a lot of work done. They, uh, they kind of dealt with when people could come in and do some volunteer work, and also how to how to uh, meet people where they are, as opposed right. to kind of under the old old methods. You know, and that's and again, that's one of the reasons that I'm so fascinated by the community school model. Yes, and the uh -huh. fact that the, it's about bringing people in from yes. the community. Uh -huh. And so you, most people look to the PTA because you have a child in school. Uh -huh. But there's lots of ways the community can come in and help, regardless Absolutely. of whether you have a child in school. Yes. And so that's very interesting to me too with the community school model, as I heard Jane Quinn talk about it in New York City, where mm -hmm. they have 245 community schools is they have drop-in meetings every morning before school starts. Oh, that's and, excellent. And so every morning, and she said, and so for some of the schools, like they they uh, manage 16 of them in the South Bronx, Harlem, and Washington Heights. Mm -hmm. She says on any given morning, there are 20 to 40 parents there. And we've had some conversations about improving the interaction between the school system and uh, the county so we could provide both resources and facilities that, that do both. So uh, it, one of the things that uh, Supervisor Penny Gross and I have discussed is when uh, the time comes uh, to build a school and a, a, a community facility in the Wilston area that we can combine up there. Yes. That, and so that would be a That's wonderful exactly opportunity there to have health services, to have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we, we've been kind of brainstorming and blue skying, you know, what would, what would we want um, in a, a great co-located facility? And uh, you could have a computer lab that the students could use during the day and 
uh, the community could use at night. Right. You could combine library resources. So there are a lot of things that we can do if we work together, uh, the school system and the county board, to, to bring some of these, these resources together. But you know, as we talked about earlier, sometimes when you introduce a new idea, not everybody jumps on board going, oh, I love your idea. Yeah. A lot of times there are people like, well, why would we do that? And mm -hmm. there's resistance. There's, there's a lot of tension in creating something new or changing something old for that matter. Yes. People have ideas yes. and you know and we've seen that a lot and you have seen that a lot. Yes we have. Change is hard. It is. Um, we dealt with that with the later start time issue with discipline reform. Our board took about two years uh, to uh, do significant changes on discipline. There was a time when we had a lot of out-of-school suspensions which didn't really help Anybody. No, anybody. We had students going home and watching television for three or five days and then coming back. It just didn't do anything. We ha now have, use a lot more in-school suspension and we have people in our schools to uh, work with the students when they are in in-school suspension. We use restorative justice approaches. So we have students come together. We have uh, positive behavior approaches as well where we encourage students to talk to one another and resolve their, their differences. So we have made great progress. One of my uh, uh, issues uh, during discipline reform was parent notification. At the time when a student was in trouble, we were taking way too long, to my mind, to right. inform parents that their student was in trouble. And having the students come in and um, have full interviews and, and write down what happened and and they did not know what their rights were and and the parents were not informed and, yeah. and parents when they realized my my student can be there for some period of time being questioned and, and I don't know what that this is happening so we did improve that I think we could still improve that some more but we did say that you have to try to get the parent before you ask a student for a written statement about uh, the the incident and I, that is a step forward so uh, we did do a lot on that that was very contentious as well in my district, we uh, had two years where we were talking uh, about whether or not to change the name of Stewart High School, which was named uh, in the 1950s after a Confederate general. Uh, that was very contentious. It still is. The board, after a great deal of deliberation and after a great deal of public engagement, did decide that it was time to change the name of that high school. And so we, uh, with, uh, we, we did make the decision to change the name in July. I uh, had a great deal of public engagement after that. Uh, it, was, uh, it was still difficult because 73 names were proposed as a new name. None came anywhere close to being a majority vote. Right. So the board was uh, given the top five and uh, we had to come to consensus on what made sense uh, based on the community engagement that, that we had had. Um, in October, we did choose the name Justice High School, and so we're moving forward with that. Um, we're in transition now, though, and the uh, students have chosen a mascot. The, the mascot they chose were the wolves, so they'll be the Justice Wolves, and the superintendent would like to see this happen before the next school year. We gave him two years to do that, but he's uh, he wants to get it get the transition uh, completed, and uh, for the next for next fall. So that's well, where know, we are with that. One of my favorite quotes is about the arc of history is mm -hmm. long, but it bends toward justice. Mm -hmm. And um, in the last two days, two days ago, Justin Fairfax had handed the gavel over in the Senate because they wanted to convene in honor of Stonewall Jackson. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so what he did, and I thought it was a very statesmanlike thing to do, is he simply removed himself and handed it over to mm -hmm. the, the, the pro tem, the president pro tem of the Senate, and stepped away. But people have pointed out when Justin was inaugurated, he carried in his pocket the manumission papers yes. from his great grandfather, who was a slave. And so I think as Virginians, we need to understand we have to represent everybody. And, and we can be proud of our history while acknowledging, as I think the governor did in his inaugural address, that it's complicated. Mm -hmm. Our history is very complex, but it doesn't define who we are going forward. One thing that made a difference certainly was uh, Charlottesville. When uh, board members saw the uh, Confederate flag next to the Nazi flag and the violence uh, down there, I, I think that made it clear to some that we really do need to, uh, to make this change. And uh, as, as difficult as it can be, uh, we did the right thing. 
and uh, we will move forward with it and uh, hope that we can bring the community together. Well, as we said, you know, five years from now, who, who's going to remember really how it came to be Justice High School? Because that's the nature of the human psyche. Mm. Things change and we're there with the change and we don't really spend a lot of time sitting around remembering how we got to where we are. Well, I hope there's a uh, new energy and enthusiasm around this. Uh, I, we're going to be having to get new uniforms for the students uh, with the new name and with the new mascot on it. Um, so there will be uh, hopefully uh, a, lot of, a lot of energy around the new name when, when the time comes. So um, that's something that we'll, we'll be dealing with. I know other jurisdictions are as well. I hear Arlington Ta County is tackling this issue. Prince William County has been looking at it. Petersburg is looking at changing the name of, of three elementary schools there. And um, this, is, this is actually an issue that is being dealt with throughout the country as well. It is. It is. Yes. But, you know, Virginia is one of the original 13 colonies and actually we had more slaves and we were the the center of the slave trade more than any other state in the entire colony mm. and so I think Virginians don't know that and I don't think students are taught that that Virginia was locust for the slave trade and so our responsibility is enormous and probably we have a li little more of that history here than maybe other states have where they are too so we just have to deal with that that's just that's who we are. It's one of one of many issues that we have. Um, if we have a little bit more time, sure. I'd like to talk about uh, the, the buildings. Speaking of, of sure. high schools, we we also have uh, a need, a great need for renovating our schools and for because of our growth. You know, we, our growth is slowed, but uh, we are still growing, and so uh, we we do need more bond money for our renovations and for brand new schools because that's coming up as well. And so. Thank you so much for being here and the fact that people need to be involved in these budget hearings, right? Correct. We will be having uh, budget hearings coming up soon um, and uh, then a work session and we will approve the budget in February. And this is exactly what you need to know.